Hi, thank you for tuning into the Shorts Text. I'm Isa Quintero, Young Adult Librarian. And I'm Lizzie <laughs> Jelly, Virtual Engagement Librarian. This is the show where we talk to you about what we've been reading, listening to, or watching. And this month we are talking to you about what we've been watching. Yes, there's so many good films that have come out in the last couple of years, and so many of them available from the library. Yeah, yeah. We've got some stuff from Canopy, we've got some stuff from our DVD collection, so I will go ahead and start with my first one that I watched. It actually was An American Pickle, which came out in 2020. It was one of those films that was released as a digital only at first, oh, and okay. so it came out on HBO Max, and then they eventually released it on DVD, and it stars Seth Rogen, and it's based on the short story Sellout by Simon Rich, and <laughs> Seth Rogen plays two different characters. He plays Herschel Greenbaum, and he plays Ben Greenbaum. Okay. And so it is the story of Herschel Greenbaum, who is this man who in the early 1900s immigrates to the United States, and he's Austrian Jew, I believe, and he's working at a pickle factory, and he falls (laughs) into a vat of pickle juice (laughs) and is preserved in this vat of pickle juice for 100 years and wakes up in 2019 or 2020 and, uh, you know, everybody that he knew is gone and the world is completely different. But they managed to track down his only living descendant. And that is Ben Greenbaum, who works in IT. He's like developing an app and he's kind of a loner and he hasn't really figured out what's going on in his life, even though he's in his 30s and, you know, he lives in an apartment in New York. And so they kind of help each other. But it's it's also a comedy. They they also drive each other crazy because <laughs> um, they are very different. Because Herschel's very determined and very like proud of himself and and of all his accomplishments. And you just do things. And Ben is tied up by all this anxiety, mm-hmm. and he like doesn't want to do things. And ultimately, there's so <laughs> when he's in Austria, I believe at the beginning of the movie. The village is ransacked by Cossacks, and so he's like, Cossacks are evil. And so then when he comes to the United States and finds that his, 100 years later, Mm -hmm. he finds that his wife has died, and he goes to the cemetery where his wife is buried, and there's this giant billboard for Russian vodka, (laughs) (laughs) like right by where she's buried. And so he makes it his mission to like get this, buy this land and get this billboard put (laughs) off of it. And Ben's like, there's no way that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, but because it's like 2020, uh, Herschel starts his own artisanal pickle truck. He goes to the trash and picks out a bunch of like jars and puts them out in the rain and <laughs> the dumpster dives because he, no. No, he has no money. Right. Like, he goes to the store and tries to buy cucumbers and they're like 90 cents a cucumber. And he's like, this is ridiculous. So then he goes dumpster diving and like picks a bunch of cucumbers oh my gosh. Out, out, out of the garbage. <laughs> And he makes all these pickles, and then he starts selling them out of this cart. And Ben is jealous because they get into this big fight about family and stuff. And Ben is jealous that that Herschel has all the success because, like, there's people putting him on social media and there's people. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I saw a guy selling pickles in a car on the street, I would absolutely buy one. Yeah. Of course I would. Yeah. They're like, you know, he doesn't say it, but, like, the guy um, doing his social media thing is like, these are artisanal pickles. Like, this guy makes them all himself. Like, and they're all natural. Like, he doesn't use any <laughs> preservatives. <laughs> like, because they ask, yeah, like, they would hit. Like, yeah. they would pop off. They ask him all these questions, but they don't know, like, his process. But, mm-hmm. you know, they're like, oh, are there preservatives? And he's like, no, it's just rainwater and pickle. <laughs> you know? Like, literal rainwater. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah, so Ben ends up getting the health department to go check on him. And so then the health department shuts him down, but then... One of the guys who is a huge supporter of his from social media tells him that he should get interns. So he has this whole army of people working on stuff for him. And so then Ben has him like at this debate that he's having, Ben asks him this question about his thoughts uh, on like a certain political issue. And the stuff that Herschel says is just like (laughs) outrageous because he's, you know, 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) I see real quick. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, so they keep fighting with each other, but eventually they they come back together because it's a story of family, you know, and bonding. Yeah, it was cute. It was ridiculous. It was funny. (laughs) Um, I enjoyed it. I love that. I love movies that are just a little ridiculous, you know. Uh And I I have so many technical questions about being in pickle juice for 100 years. I know, right? Now I have to watch it. Um, (laughs) Is he green? Like, does he still smell like vinegar? (laughs) 
He's not green. But. Okay. <laughs> kind of be funny if he was. <laughs> yeah, it would be funny if he was. But yeah. All right. Well, I'm also going to start with one that's a little weird, um, mm-hmm. just to stay in the vein. Mm-hmm. I watched a film called Strawberry Mansion. Um, it's an indie film. came out in 2022, and it was recommended to me by Dan, actually, here at the library. Mm-hmm. And I know a few other staff are watching it, too, because we just... We can't stop talking about it because it's it's weird. Okay. Um, it's like a indie kind of like sci-fi film in like the future in 2035 is the year mm-hmm. um, where dreams are recorded and taxed by oh. the government. Um, so companies like they secretly insert advertising into your dreams and then you pay taxes on it. Like on like the stuff that you're using in your dream. Oh no. And so they like put it on like, yeah, it's so freaky, right? <laughs> And they put it on this like little flash drive thing and they upload it in the morning and it goes boop, 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 boop. And it like has a receipt and it's like, you owe this much in dream mm-hmm. tax. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that's the basic premise. Okay. But there's like a kooky old woman who stands up against this, who lives in the Strawberry Mansion. It's this big pink Victorian house in the middle of nowhere. Um, she's coming towards the end of her life. She's pretty old. And she sends a letter to mm-hmm. someone who she knows is a dream auditor to come and audit her dreams, basically, because she has refused to move to the new digital system where they like, I don't know, it's like a flash drive for their dreams. Uh-huh. Um, so she records all of her dreams on VHS tapes, even though, you know, you haven't been supposed to do that for like, I don't know, it was like 10 years or something. So she has just like thousands of VHS tapes in her house of all of her dreams. Okay. And she invites this um, tax auditor in to come take a look because what she really wants to do is share the ways that she has been able to avoid having any corporate influence Mm -hmm. on her dreams. Mm -hmm. Um, And people act like she's like a conspiracy theorist. She's like, there's no way. The government would (laughs) never allow that. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And the film shows you some of their dreams. Like it starts with our tax auditor and his dreams, which are a very small little pink room. And like his buddy Mm -hmm. comes in. And is like, oh, I got you fried chicken from your favorite place down the street. Here's their new special. Here is, you can get a free Coke with this uh-huh. size kind of thing. And they're like, uh-oh, you have a spider. Here is this brand new. And it's literally like you're watching QVC. And he okay. like holds up like a new like spider killing spray kind of thing. Uh-huh. And it's just like, I don't know. It's very um, jarring. <laughs> you know, when you're watching it and you're like, ooh, this is unnerving. Like this feels wrong and weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the auditor, he's like, yeah, this is totally totally normal, right? These are just what my dreams look like. And Mm -hmm. I pay taxes on the chicken I eat in my dream. Um, (laughs) So he goes to her and he's like, I don't know what's going on here. He's like, this is a weird one. I don't want to be assigned this call. We're in the middle of nowhere. And she's like, oh, just stay at my house. Like Mm -hmm. the hotel's far away. And he's like, "Mm, old weird old woman invites me to just like live at her house (laughs) full of DVD, not DVDs, full of VHS tapes. She's got like a little turtle named Sugar Baby that she carries everywhere with her. And he's like, hmm. Yeah, why not? Absolutely. I will stay. So he starts, like, watching her dreams and stuff on the VHS. I mean, he has to put on this big, like, <laughs> it looks like those, like, old school kind of scuba diving helmet okay. things. Mm-hmm. Like, it's huge. And it, like, lights up. And it's like, beep, beep, beep. Yeah. <laughs> and so he's watching her dreams, which are just, like, you know, what I would consider, like, normal dreams. Uh-huh. Now, like, you know, they're a little weird. Like, there's a man made entirely of grass walking mm-hmm. around. She's, like, playing the violin, running through a field, mm-hmm. happy out. Yeah. And there's no... um he has his little like tax goggles on and he's looking at stuff to tax and there's nothing. He's like, wait a minute. This doesn't seem right. And so he keeps watching him, right? And he gets sucked in and he like gets sucked into her dream world and how like creative it is and individual. And then he goes to sleep that night and the dream version of her, which is like her younger self, visits mm-hmm. him in his dream. And he like sees her in the window going like, open the door, open the door. Uh-huh. And then his buddy who's uh-huh. the one who always comes in to bring him the advertised products in the stream is like don't let her in <laughs> and the guy's like what <laughs> and so kind of some chaos ensues um as he discovers what dreams are like without corporate influence and he has to kind of navigate one the end of her life all of her dvds and the, what it means that the government is kind of doing this to people's dreams mm-hmm. and like the conspiracy of like who's causing this how we can break out of it yeah. and her dream self and his dream is like once they know that you know you're not safe anymore. Uh-huh. And so they do like those creative dream escapes. She's like, they only, there's only one way out of this. And he's like, what? He's like, we got to swim. And so they just magically end up in the ocean. They're like swimming. Uh-huh. Um, but it's very, um, it's really cool. Like it's beautiful to watch. It's very stylized. I like to think of it. It looked kind of like a really gritty Wes Anderson film. Okay. Like it's a lot of like a very specific color palette. It's very saturated. The aesthetics are very specific mm-hmm. in the film. 
Um, and it's got, I don't know, a lot of really interesting commentary on just like capitalism, consumerism, government surveillance. Um, and it's it's just a little weird, yeah. too. So if you like films, they're just kind of kind of odd. I would recommend it. It's not super long. It's like maybe an hour and a half, but I enjoyed it. Okay. Cool. Yeah, it sounds neat. Um, it's super weird. Yeah, like I'm thinking about like my dreams and I'm like, I don't ever dream about corporate products. So yeah, that'd be that'd But now be I'm thinking weird. about it, right? <laughs> now I'm paying attention. I was like, is the government in my dreams? I, how would I know? How would I know? And I, I tend to remember my dreams. My dreams are so strange and yeah, they, they don't involve any sort of products. They're just Mine weird. Mine are just weird. Yeah, it's like I'm, you know, very much, oh, we got to swim. Swim through the ocean. There's like a character they call it, like the blue devil and he's just like a big furry guy running around and they have like a little dream party and like a bubble. I'm like, see, that's what my dreams are like, you know, uh-huh. just like completely untethered from reality. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's how I like them, though. Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to go into another one that was also recommended to me by one of our clerks, our clerk Rosa, Neptune Frost. Ooh, yes. And I think it had been recommended in our newsletter as well a few months ago. Um, but yeah, that one came out in 2021. It is a queer Afrofuturism musical. Um, I wasn't exactly sure what to make of it. I didn't know it was a musical. <laughs> yeah, it's a musical. Oh, my gosh. I was like, okay, we'll go with it. So, yeah, there's been a trend with uh, musicians. And so this one was written and directed by Saul Williams, who's an American rapper, and he's a poet and an actor mm. as well, and his wife, Anisia Uzeman. And it features music from his album, Martyr, Loser, King. And in recent years, we also had, like, Janelle Monet did yeah. her Dirty Computer Uh, emotion picture (laughs) she called it which was like a 48 minute long video with uh, talking and and a little bit of music and then she also did the book the memory librarian and other stories of dirty computer to go along with it uh, which is also a queer afrofuturism a short story collection so this film centers these folks that work on the hilltops of burundi and Burundi is a place in East Africa that is surrounded by like Rwanda and the Republic of the Congo. And I can't remember what other place, but it's, yeah, East Africa. Um, and the people that are featured in the film are escaped coltan miners. And so coltan is a mineral that's used in the production of like cell phones mm-hmm. and electronics. And they are trying to overthrow their fascist system and escape from this colonialist environment and they form a computer hacker collective okay and so uh, they end up forming a camp in an e-waste dump and there they attempt to overtake the authoritarian regime um, that is exploiting the region's natural resources and also its people and they you know kind of talk about in the lyrics of the song you know about how people are also a natural resource and how to some other people from outside of the region these people are seen as a commodity, but they're like, no, we are people with our history and, you know, lives and we have families and all of these different things. And yeah, it was really neat. It's mostly not in English. It's, mm-hmm. um, and it was weird too, because there are, there is a little bit of English and there's also a little bit of French mixed in. So that's what I was wondering. If yeah. There was some French. Yeah. There's a little bit of French. There's a little bit of English, but then there's, um, so it's all subtitled and a lot of the stories told through the lyrics of songs, but it's mm-hmm. like a lot of musicals, you know, it's, there's a song and then there's like some action and then there's a song and then there's some like, you know, talking. But one thing that I liked about it, cause I was like, it'll be really weird if they do this, but there's only like two different musical numbers where there was some drumming and a little bit of dancing, but mostly it was just like, you know, people singing to each other. Um, Cause sometimes like, I like musicals, but sometimes musicals when you got the big chorus <laughs> ensemble and everybody's dancing it and whatever. Me a bit much, I was like, that's yeah. gonna be weird if everybody's like out in this like e-waste dump, like <laughs> having a yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't, they don't do that. But yeah, so they tell the story through these songs, and um, it features this these two different characters, an intersex person and this guy who had worked at the mine, and they come together. And they lead the people through this this revolution. Um, and it was really neat in terms of the visuals. Because at the beginning of the film, it's it looks kind of like what things look like today, other than the cell phones that people have are these weird little circle things oh. with a little screen in the middle. And then as the film goes on, there, it becomes more stylized. And there's really, like, it was really cool how they incorporated all these really different electronic waste things into mm-hmm. the costumes so like somebody has a vest that's made out of like computer keys oh cool um and then like people have like resistors woven through their hair and like yeah it just the visuals were really neat it got some very vibrant colors and i i enjoyed it i wasn't really sure what to make of it when i started but i was like all right i got into it and okay. <laughs> if you're not a musical person maybe it's not the film for you but if you like sci-fi, if you like musicals, if you like hip-hop, if you like things that kind of delve into 
social issues because a lot of this, you know, is is the e-waste dumps and also the effects of, you know, mining for these different resources in order to create our technology that we have today. And we don't often think about where these resources come from or how the, you know, the getting of them affects the communities where they are gotten from. So, so yeah. Yeah, it sounds so cool. I remember Rosa, I think, reviewed it. Yeah. It was either for the newsletter or maybe on our social media. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, that looks so interesting. And it's, it's on Canopy, right? Uh, I didn't watch it on Canopy. I watched it on, um, we had the DVD. But oh, yeah, perfect. I believe it's also on Canopy. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Well, you've got multiple ways to access it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. My next one is um, a bit more of a, a normal mm-hmm. pick. Um, well, normal for me anyway. Mm-hmm. But I watched Mr. Malcolm's List. Okay. Um, and this has become, honestly, one of my comfort movies. Um, came out in 2022 based on the romance novel by Susanna Allen. Um, we have it on DVD and it's also on Canopy. Um, but it is perfect if you are like a fan of Jane Austen, of Bridgerton, um, anything like that. Because it's a Regency romance okay. at its core. Okay. Um, and it's it's so fun. If you're into that sort of thing, you'll love it. Um, mm-hmm. It's got a lot of vibes like Pride and Prejudice kind of energy, even a little bit of Sense and Sensibility. Just mm-hmm. like the, you know... The miscommunications, like one's too proud to like admit they like the other one, all of that kind of stuff. But it's set in Regency England, um, where Julia Thistlewaite, who is a jilted suitor, seeks revenge on a very, very picky Mr. Malcolm and his very famous list of requirements that a potential bride needs to meet. <laughs> and he has like, it's like a literal list of like 10 things that she has to have to be perfect for him. Uh-huh. And Julia is, I love her at her core, but she is loud she is very proud of herself she does not know a lot of things about social issues and she does not care um, so she's just built a little different than he is like he the scene where he kind of jilts her they're at the opera together and he asks her opinion on the corn laws and she just kind of looks at him and she's like well i'm for them of course like having no <laughs> idea what they even are and he's like hmm interesting um, and he's like just like crosses her off his little lips. <laughs> But Julia, not to be thwarted so quickly, because she's like, you know what? He is the catch of the season. I see myself as also the catch of the season, so I'm going to make this work. She says she's going to get revenge on him. And so she enlists the help of her friend, Selena Dalton, who she's known like since they were in school together, very young, um, who has... She's not from the aristocracy like Julia is, but had a benefactor kind of pay for her to go to school. And she's been serving as a companion to an older woman for a couple years. The older woman's died, so she's a little bit adrift. So Julia says, come stay with me in London. Like, it'll be excellent. We're going to have a great time. So Selena shows up like, I am so happy to see you, my old friend. Julia's like, yeah, yeah, great. I need you to help me with a revenge plot. (laughs) (laughs) And so they turn Selena into Mr. Malcolm's perfect bride right they um have julia's i think it's her brother help figure out exactly what's on mr malcolm's list and then they train selena to fit those requirements um and they like introduce them have them go on a couple dates with julia's intention of humiliating him at the end of it by having selena jilt him okay. in return and be like how does it feel not to measure up to someone else's like unachievable requirements mm. so there's you know some shenanigans yeah. that ensue Um, There's plenty of ballroom scenes, plenty of just excellent costumes Mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, But, you know, what could go wrong when two people who aren't supposed to fall in love are spending all their time together (laughs) and, you know, going on all these dates and all these romantic scenarios and they're not supposed to catch feelings? Hmm, Mm -hmm. I wonder what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) But it's it's pretty cool. And there's like, you know, we get to see Julia and Selena kind of navigate that rift in their friendship as Selena's like, I don't feel comfortable doing this anymore. Like, we're hurting a real person. And Mm -hmm. Julia's like, but he's mean. Mm -hmm. He was mean to me. So we should hurt him. Mm -hmm. Um, So we get to navigate that. Julia kind of has to have a sort of like if you've seen a red Emma, Mm -hmm. that kind of moment when she has to reevaluate whether what she's doing is just for her own entertainment or actually helping other people. And Julia has to have that same kind of reckoning moment. Um, and it's it's really cute. It has a happy ending, of course it does, because it's a romance. <laughs> um, and it's got some really great performances in it. Like the actress who plays Julia, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but she is just iconic uh-huh. in her role. She's so over the top and uh-huh. incredible. And it's just beautiful. It's like a quick little romantic watch if you need just a little, a little sweet treat this spring. I okay. would highly recommend it. Okay. Yeah, so the next one I'm going to talk about is... Not a romantic comedy, but it kind of feels like that. Okay, okay. Um, it is called Together Together, and I watched it on Canopy, and it's from 2021. It stars Ed Helms, who played Andy in The Office. Okay. And Patty Harrison, and it was written and directed by Nicole Beckwith. Um, Ed Helms plays this guy who's in his 
early 40s and he really wants to have a baby but he has not found the right woman and like has had a lot of failed relationships and so he decides to go through a surrogate to have a child and so he ends up meeting this woman and she is somebody who gave up because um, in order to be a surrogate I guess you have to have had a child before sure yeah um and so he ends up meeting this woman who had a child in her teens and gave it up for adoption and he chooses her to be the surrogate of his child and she is probably 10 years younger than him. And so they form this friendship with each other. Um, she's kind of a loner, uh, and so is he. And they're very different in some ways, but they're also similar in some ways. And, yeah, she works at a coffee shop, and she doesn't want to tell anybody about, you know, the fact that she's pregnant. She doesn't want to tell anybody that she's going to be a surrogate. And he's like, well, why wouldn't you, you know? And he's just all excited. He just doesn't and, get like, it, yeah, yeah, when she gets pregnant, he's all excited. He, like, it's interesting because trying to watch him navigate the relationship that they have um because like he you know gets to go with her to her prenatal visits at the doctor to see the baby and everything and so he ends up bringing this giant teddy bear oh my gosh and then he's like you know, so embarrassing he's like oh i brought this and then she's like that's probably for the baby right and he's like oh yeah and she's like yeah so you should keep it because it's going as, yeah the baby's gonna be yours like i'm not gonna like and he's like oh yeah sorry you know <laughs> But then he asks her, like, out to dinner and because he wants to get to know more about her. And she's kind of like, eh, I don't know. But she ends up going out to dinner with him. They get to know each other. And um, it's interesting because it, it explores a lot of ideas about friendship between a man and a woman and also relationships between a man and a woman. Because, you know, he makes some comments about you can tell that he kind of might have some romantic feelings towards mm -hmm. her or might be starting to go that way. And she, you know, talks to him about, like, how weird it is, like, a lot of, like, Woody Allen movies or movies like this where, like, the guy's, like, 40 and the girl's, like, 20 or whatever. And she's just like, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, and um, his feelings get a little hurt. And then at one point he, because he wants to, like, you know, he's in this, like, daddy mode. He's like, I want to provide. And he's stuff. nesting. Yeah. yeah, he's nesting. And so he buys her these clogs because he read somewhere online that they were, like, good for her. Clogs? Like, Yeah, Stop. that they were going to be good for her feet. And, like, since she's on her feet all day. And she, like, he brings them to her work. And she's just, like, go, oh, no. go away. And then, like, since she won't accept him at work, he ends up going to her house and trying to deliver them to her at her house. And as she's leaving her apartment, this, like, other guy comes out of the apartment. And he's, like, a young guy that's, like, her age. Mm -hmm. And she's, like, oh, you know, I'll talk to you later. And he's, like, did you just have sex with him? Oh, my he's, like, my baby's inside of you. Like, and he's, like, freaking out. And oh, she's no. just, like, you don't get anything yeah, that's not how that any works. of this. Like, boundaries. Like, but then they end up navigating boundaries together. And he, she ends up helping him, like, decorate the nursery and all this stuff. And they do form this really sweet friendship between each other. But I think it was really neat watching, you know, these two people try to figure out, like, okay, traditionally this is what this relationship would look mm -hmm. like. This is not a traditional thing. Like, we are not re involved romantically. You know, how how involved do we stay with each other? And um, it's kind of got a bittersweet ending. She, you know, he wants her to, he wants to stay in touch with her after mm -hmm. the baby's born. And she's... Like, well, I don't know about that. And um, she ends up deciding that the, what she's going to do with the money, because she gets paid, like, I think it's like $20,000 or sure, something like yeah. that, um, that she's going to go back to college because she never got to go to college. And Aww. she gets accepted to college across the country because this is like, they're like in California and she's going to go to school in Vermont. Um, but he's like super excited with her for her when she gets accepted to college. And it kind of like the ending leads that open ended where like, we don't know what happens. You know, do they stay in touch? Do they not stay in touch after the baby's born? But like, it ends with the baby being born and like, um yeah it was just really sweet and i i think it's interesting because there's a lot of you know i don't know there's a lot of folks that are like oh men and women can't be friends blah 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 blah, <laughs> yeah. blah you know and this movie really shows that like yes they can be and yeah it might be awkward to navigate some of the things but like if people really care about each other and like they can be there to support each other and they can be friends and without anything else happening and it can yeah. be a great relationship and they can like love each other like at one point they tell each other they love each other and Aww. i'm like that's so sweet you know because he's like she's carrying my baby but she's not like my romantic partner right. but like but she's willing to do this for me you know and like yeah no i really liked it um so that's together 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 mm -hmm. huh. i have to watch that that sounds really cute yeah. actually yeah. i love those kind of movies yeah, yeah. <laughs>
All right. Well, speaking on this, my next pick is actually very on theme. <laughs> <laughs> I watched Unpregnant, okay. which is um, came out in 2022. It's based on the young adult novel of the same name by Jenny Hendrix. Mm-hmm. Similar in some ways, but very different in others. Mm-hmm. Um, it follows 17-year-old Missouri high school senior Veronica as she discovers she's unexpectedly pregnant. Her mm-hmm. senior year kind of thing. And she's got she's got college plans. She's got a boyfriend kind of thing. Um, taking the test in like the high school bathroom. It's like the classic opening scene, yeah, yeah. you know. And she's there, and then she's like, "Uh oh." And who would she run into in the bathroom, of course, while she's got it in her hand Mm -hmm. with the result right there? But her ex-best friend, Bailey, who has, like, you know, since they stopped being friends, become, like, a bit of, like, more of, like, a loner at school, doesn't really have a lot of friends, gets kind of poked fun of a lot, but has, like, a a good energy Mm -hmm. about her. So, of course, she runs into whoever it is in the bathroom, um, doesn't know it's Veronica at first, but is like, hey, are you, like, okay in there? You sound upset kind of things. Like, I... I don't know how I can help, but I could, like, you know, I've got a car. I could give you a ride somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then Veronica comes out and Bailey's like, oh, I don't know why I was being so nice. I didn't know it was you. Mm -hmm. Then sees the test and is like, oh, my goodness. Freaks out kind of thing. Um, And they have, like, a little moment. And Veronica's just like, please shut up. Please shut up. I can't. I can't do this right now. (laughs) Um, But Bailey ends up, like, taking the test look at it. Um, Someone else comes into the bathroom. Bailey quick hides it. Disappears, basically. Veronica starts panicking because she's like, oh, my gosh, Mm -hmm. she has my test. Mm -hmm. She has the result. Mm -hmm. She knows it's me. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do? They run into each other later on. Um, Bailey tells her, she's like, don't worry. I threw it in the dumpster behind the school so no one would see it. Your secret's safe with me. Like, I'm not a juror kind of thing. And Veronica's like, oh, thank goodness. But also, don't do that ever again. (laughs) And she's like, you know, at that point, like, okay, now I got to, like, make some plans. Think about whatever's going on. Turns out the recycling club at the school goes through the dumpsters Mm -hmm. to pull out the recycling to make a point and guess what they find Mm -hmm. a positive pregnancy test in the high school dumpster so of course the rumor meal takes off veronica starts panicking Mm because all her friends are talking about it and making guesses and she's sitting there like oh no i gotta do something i gotta do something so she you know starts making some going through like what her options are figuring out what's going on but she lives in a state of missouri Mm -hmm. where if you are under 18 you cannot access abortion Mm -hmm. without parental consent and she's also from a fairly um religious family um and is very scared about how her parents would react Mm -hmm. to that kind of thing so she's like all right we gotta figure out what else to do so she's like well step one i'm gonna tell my boyfriend see Mm -hmm. what's going on so this is oh my gosh i just (laughs) i'm internally cringing as i remember this scene because it is just so much but they go out to dinner and like they're 17. Mm-hmm. They are 17 mm-hmm. for perspective. Mm-hmm. They go to like, you know, the nicest little little restaurant in town. And <laughs> she's like, I have something important to tell you. And he's like, I know what it is. <laughs> Cause he's heard the rumor mill. And mm-hmm. he's like, I have an idea, um, kind of thing. And mm-hmm. she's like, I'm pregnant, but I'm gonna figure this out, kind of thing. And mm-hmm. what does he do but pull out an engagement uh-huh. ring? They are uh-huh. 17 uh-huh. in the middle of a restaurant in front of all these other people. And you just see her that her eyes get so big and you just see her get so angry. She's like, what are you doing? Stand up. Stand up. <laughs> and he's like, I love you so much. Now you don't have to leave to go to college. We can stay here in the hometown forever and ever. Mm-hmm. And she just you see the panic. She mm-hmm. bolts out kind of thing. He follows her and she's like, I I need some time. But she, like, looks at the ring, which is a fairly expensive kind mm-hmm. of ring, like a thing. And she's like, mm, do you mind if I hang on to this for a while? She takes that, goes almost immediately to Bailey's house. Mm-hmm. She's like, I don't know who else is going to help me. I can't tell my friends. I can't tell my family. The only place that I can go to access an abortion is, like, a thousand miles away. Mm-hmm. And I don't have a car. Mm-hmm. And guess who has a car? Bailey. Mm-hmm. And Bailey's like... Yeah, let's go. We'll go this weekend. We'll make a road trip. We can stop and see, like, Roswell, New Mexico. On our way. <laughs> uh-huh. She's like, we'll do, like, look at the aliens. Um, so they end up on a road trip together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as it is, two 17-year-olds on the road in a car driving long hours, so many shenanigans mm-hmm. ensue. And it's just, <laughs> I don't know. I really, I really enjoyed it. And I think, I don't know, when I was a teenager, right, the movie Juno mm-hmm. came out with Elliot Page, Michael Sarah, and everything. And it was such a scandal. Mm-hmm. A movie like about teenagers and pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And I just love that we're now at a time where a movie like this can exist mm-hmm. still. And we can talk about this stuff. And it was actually like a really fun coming of age kind of comedy mm-hmm. that dealt with a really complex situation with a lot of care and a lot of insight and not a ton of like 
judgment. It had a lot of information in it and it like walked through her thought process Mm -hmm. and like the different ways of like how the system works and like what access to kind of like reproductive health care looks like when you're under 18. Mm -hmm. And I really liked the way it was filmed because there are some really great setups of like whether or not they are children or adults Mm -hmm. in this situation. Mm -hmm. So there's like at one point when Veronica is like going through her options, she's like sitting on a literal playground Mm -hmm. trying to Google abortion (laughs) clinics. And it's just like, it's heartbreaking to see. It's like, she's like a child navigating this on her own. And then the next scene we see her and Bailey, not the next scene, but later on, Mm -hmm. there's her and Bailey already on the road trip eating a sandwich underneath a big old billboard Mm -hmm. for um, like sex workers. Mm -hmm. And it says, hot young girls, barely 18. Mm -hmm. And so they're juxtaposed between all these different situations. And it's just, you get the people, the unexpected people who help them along the way, you know, including the the demo derby driver Mm -hmm. (laughs) who meets them at a county fair. Um, And then... His name was Bob. He ran like a he was a doomsday prepper who ran like a limo rental agency. And after their car breaks down, he's like, I'll drive. You. Don't worry. So he's there in like his full camouflage kind of thing. Like, mm-hmm. I don't trust the government, but you're right. You you need a ride. And he's like, he becomes such like a really neat, like little um like an influence on them. And he's like taking care of them. And he's just this like this really like hardened older guy uh-huh. <laughs> driving them in a limo of all things <laughs> to the clinic and it's just so many kind of kooky situations but it was really cool to see them like not just navigate an adult situation um, but navigate their own friendship with each other mm-hmm. and then navigate their relationships outside of that as well like mm-hmm. Veronica with her parents when she gets back um, and to see who they can call on for help mm-hmm. when like they don't know who to call mm-hmm. and it was I thought it was really well done it was super funny there are so many just truly laugh out loud moments like Mm -hmm. I'm not the type to really laugh out loud when I'm watching stuff but I was cackling Mm -hmm. at some of these scenarios and I loved it would actually highly recommend it I have not read the book but I'm going to Mm -hmm. now because I thought the movie was so fun Mm -hmm. yeah I haven't seen the movie but I have read read the book book? I read the book and the book is very cinematic so and I remember listening to the audiobook and laughing out loud I thought the audiobook's hilarious (laughs) some of the scenarios I'm like I just how did she even come up with this like I love this so much it's so funny yeah yeah so now I know I gotta watch the movie it's worth a watch it truly is (laughs) cool um so another one that I have is a documentary that actually came out last year, 2022, and it's called The Pez Outlaw. So I'm <gasps> a little little off track here, but it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, so this one I actually got because uh, it just came up on my TikTok. Like somebody was like talking about it and was like, you should watch this movie. And I was like, all right, cool. And so it is this documentary about this man named Steve Glue. And he is from Michigan and he used to be a machinist and, you know, kind of living paycheck to paycheck and uh, has a little bit of OCD. And at one point in his life, he used to collect cereal boxes and then ship in the uh, UPC codes to get all the prizes that you can get from cereal boxes. And because of him, the cereal company started saying one per household because he had this this it's so many thing going on where he would get them all shipped to his house and then he would go to toy conventions and he would sell them to people. Oh, um, okay. he would sell them for like a dollar, two dollars, and make money. And so once the cereal companies were like, "Yep, no more. Um, you get one per household." He was like, "All right, well, what do I do now?" And he happened to be at one of these toy conventions and discovered Pez dispensers. And you know, Pez dispensers are these little plastic things with a little head on top mm-hmm. that can be a different character and, you know, have this candy that's not very good. Um, <laughs> it's really bad. It's really actually. bad. It's yeah. chalky. It's, you know, not good at all. But there's people out there who collect these things. Mm-hmm. And so he met this person at one of these conventions and found out that they were going to Europe to get ones that were not available in the U.S. Oh. Uh, and they were selling them for hundreds to thousands of dollars. For Pez dispensers? For Pez dispensers. Whoa. Um, and so apparently Pez is headquartered, or at the time was headquartered in Europe. Okay. And um, the way that Pez worked was that the European headquarters distributed to everywhere in the world except the United States. Interesting. And then the United States had their own distribution, and they wanted complete control over which Pez dispensers got shipped to the U.S. and which ones didn't. And so there's all sorts of Pez dispensers that get shipped to the rest of the world that don't ever make it to the and United States. Get. Um, And the person who decides this is named, or they call him the president. The president. He is the president of the the company, the Pez company in the United States. That's hilarious. Um, And so, so yeah, so he's the one who gets creative control over what comes in and what doesn't come in. 
And so this guy, Steve, got this information and he decided on a whim to go to Europe. And, you know, and his wife was kind of worried about him because he has OCD and he's got like social anxiety and he doesn't really do well out in public. And, I'd like, be worried about him too. Yeah. yeah. And so she ended up convincing her son, Josh, to go with him. And at the time, Josh was like 17 and this was like in the early 90s. And so he goes with his dad to Europe and like they... You know, he's like, we're using these maps, like the, the like things going on in Eastern Europe at the time with like wars and stuff. They like ended up in some weird situations with like, he's like, there's people with like machine guns and he's like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And like, we, we don't speak the language, but ultimately they end up at this Pez factory and they get to see all these prototypes and they get to see, talk to the designer and he gifts them a couple of Pez that have never been produced. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And um, one of them was a Pez dispenser called Bubble Boy, which is a guy who looks like he's blowing a bubble. Oh. And then um, there was like, a, he gave him a couple other ones. And um, you know, they, they, they went with like, I don't know, like $1,000 or something and bought like $1,000 worth of Pez dispensers that were not available in the U.S. And they brought them back. And then they went to the toy conventions, and they were able to sell them for, like, hundreds of dollars. Wow. And then people found out through the grapevine, because there's, like, the, the documentary, like, follows all these different collectors. And it's interesting, because you see these collectors, and, like, they're, like, some of them, their houses are just, like, full of Pez dispensers. or full of wow. different stuff. So, like, this one house you, you see, like, the guy has, like, Pez dispensers lining the wall up his staircase, and then he's got, like, Pez dispensers everywhere. And then another house you see, like... A guy has, like, Funko Pops, and then he's got Pez dispensers, and then he's got, like, some other kind of toy, you know. So all these different collectors, and they talk to them because, you know, they all know each other from these these conventions. And so he ends up coming back and ends up selling them. And through the grapevine, some people find out, because this kid's, like, 17, he's telling people about how he got this exclusive bubble boy. And they find out that he has Bubble Boy. And so there's people who are, like, coming out of the woodwork who are, like, I'll pay you, you know, like, oh, $5,000 so like a... for, like, Bubble Boy. That's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. And so he ends up, they end up selling Bubble Boy. Like, Bubble Boy helps pay for the kid to go to college. Oh, that's um, cool. And so then he and his son just keep going back to Europe and bringing back Pez dispensers. And he literally made millions of dollars off of selling Pez dispensers. But as this was happening... So the Pez Corporation in the U.S. has like spies who go to these toy conventions, <laughs> and they Pez were spy, uh -huh. yeah. And they were like finding out about these underground Pez mm -hmm. market things. And so one thing that is interesting in the film that it talks about is that apparently, if a company does not register its patent with the uh, U.S. Customs. Like yeah. you can bring stuff in and like oh. they they they, they the mold because that's that that was like a thing too. I was like, how did, he, how did he bring all these things in? Because you see him like in the documentary, like bringing like <laughs> duffel bags just full of Pez dispensers, and he says he remembers going through customs and then just like dumping everything out oh and like gosh. having like the drug sniffing dogs and like all this stuff. But it's literally just, just Pez, Pez dispensers, dispensers. <laughs> and they're like looking through things and you know trying to find documentation. And the customs officer who saw him was just like, you know what? If they were too stupid to register their, you know, patent on these things and to, you know, to not allow people to, to bring these in, then... That's on them, that's yeah. On, that's, on, that's on them. So here you go. Take your bags Take of your pest pens. dispensers. <laughs> I was just, like, imagining the visual of just, like, suitcases full of Pez dispensers going to the airport, you know. Like, you see some weird stuff at uh -huh. airport security, but I, that would throw me for a loop. I would not be expecting that one. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, yeah, he talks about how, like, his, his whole, like, technique was to just act dumb. He's like, you know, I'm, like, a farm guy from, like, Michigan. He's like, you know, I just would act dumb and, like... <laughs> oh, my gosh. Just, well, they were cool. I don't uh -huh. know. How. He's like, and they just let me through. <laughs> But yeah, so anyway, the, the president finds out about all this stuff going on. And so what they start doing is they start they start releasing Bubble Boy here in the United States. <gasps> to devalue to it? To devalue oh, it. Oh, sneaky. Then, yeah, and then they start releasing some of the other ones here in the United States to devalue the other ones. And so he uh, ends up not being able to make as much money as he was making off of them. And so then he ends up contacting Pez Corporate and designing some Pez dispensers of his oh. own to have like a limited edition and he signs, like, a contract with them and everything. And they say, yes, these are just going to be yours. You know, um, they release them. But then the Pez America releases a similar-looking Pez dispenser, and they charge a lot less for them. <gasps> um, and so he ends up losing all this money. And it's, you know, it's a sad story because it's, like, his wife has MS and, like, 
they had bought a horse farm because, like, she was a horse, uh, like, an equine therapist. Oh, cool, um, yeah. And she talks a little bit about how, like, you know, throughout her marriage with him, like, he's always had crazy ideas. And she just was like, don't do it, don't do it. But eventually she's like, fine, whatever, do it. And, like... <laughs> But luckily, they still have their house. They still have their farm. But, That's good. Uh, you know, and he made this film partially, I think, to try and get a little bit more money, too, because they sure. lost yeah. so much money from from the the stuff, you know, that they had done before. I mean, I can't imagine having millions of dollars coming in and then all of a sudden, you know, just being That's it. Yeah. just cut off. I can't imagine that kind of money for pets. I know, honest. right? This is a lot. This it's is like wild. a conspiracy. It's I need, like, wild. a Marvel movie where the president is the villain, you know? <laughs> The way that they portray him in the documentary is like he like he like he is a villain. Well, it's like he like, sounds like he got the villain at it. Yeah, yeah. like he's just like yeah. a he he he. I've got my spies. I'm gonna. Yeah. Also, it's very <laughs> fascinating and interesting because it's like you know he goes over to Europe and like he has all these dealings with this one guy in Europe and the guy in Europe admits to knowing him, mm. but the guy in Europe is like, oh yeah, we never did that. I never said that. But like he's like, oh yeah, like the guy in Europe like you know gave me all these like. Pez for this much money and like said to I don't know you don't tell anybody that I know you you right. know all this stuff and then it was funny too because there's this other collector in Germany and he has this little shed in his backyard and he won't let the documentarians go into the shed but he brings What's out in a, the shed he brings out all these different Pez dispensers that I never even knew existed and I was like what there's like a Pez like like a little like um like a Pez gun instead oh, of like, yeah weird. There's like all sorts of weird things and he he's like that's I, the secret Pez yeah, shed yeah and so I guess. He, like, in the documentary, Steve Glue was, like, his biggest competitor because he also sells a lot of stuff, but he sells stuff in Europe, mm -hmm. and he has, like, a lot of super secret things, and he's like, I can't let you know, but he, I think also part of the reason that he didn't want to let them know what he had was because, you know, it's like, you devalue things if people yeah. know that there's more than one, or if mm -hmm. people know that there's, you know, um, and sometimes you hold on to things because, I don't know, collectors are weird. <laughs> like a really intense line of collection actually yeah. like, to have a secret Pez shed in your backyard that's uh -huh. that's a whole other level like I, I collect little things you know yeah. but I don't have a secret shed yeah, yeah. In my house. yeah no, he's got like a ladder to go up into it too oh it's like gosh. it's like a barn kind of thing and he like that's intense yeah yeah he's like he's like shh <laughs> I gotta watch this. I gotta watch this. It's documentary. great. It's like a true crime. Slash no, literally. Like, like, this is a thriller, I it think. It is. It is like a thriller. And, like, you know, and because Steve Glue had social anxiety and stuff, eventually, you know, when his son went off to college, he was going by himself. And so then he was all paranoid. And he's like, I swear there were people following me and things like that. And, you know, and maybe then, there were. I mean, but then at one, yeah, at one point, one guy admits that there, were, there was somebody following him. So he's like, so I guess I wasn't all paranoid. <laughs> Just like, oh my God, over her pets. Over these little plastic dispensers. <laughs> I'm shocked. Like, this is the pest collector world is more complex than I ever realized. Yes, it is. It's way more complex. And I was just like, whoa. wow. Whoa. Bam. So that one was really interesting. That's a great one. Uh -huh. And then um, the last one that I have is uh, Don't Worry, Darling, which came out also last oh, year. I was meaning to watch that one too. I have it checked out right now. I just haven't put it in the DVD player yet. Yeah, yeah. So um, I watched it uh, with our collection, and it uh, stars Harry Styles from Dunkirk and Florence Pugh, who a lot of you might know from Midsummer and Little Women. And it was directed by Olivia Wilde and uh, written by Katie Silverman, Carrie, and Shane Van Dyke. And it, it was not what I was expecting. That's why I wanted to watch it. There uh -huh. was so much hype around this movie and so yeah. much like um, little drama that everyone was talking about. I was like, I have to see this. I have to know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really good. Um, it's kind of dark going from the yeah. dispenser guy to this. <laughs> it's kind of like culty, right? Yeah. So basically it starts out and it's like, it feels like it's the 1950s. The women are dressed in 1950s clothing. Guys come home from work. Um, you know, women's making like this five course meal for him and she's got the babies and she's got, you know, and la la la, everything's fine. And, but then you can kind of get the sense that some things are off because there's like an interracial couple and you're like, yeah, that wasn't super common in the 1950s. So I don't know that this is like, what's going on here, you know? And then, and then you get this guy, his name's Frank and he's like, he's like the head of like their little community and he, and the, all the people that work there, all the men work at this company called Victory. And so, and, and like, you know, they're like, oh, we can't tell you what we do at our company and all this stuff. And all the men every day go off to work and you see them all drive out into this desert because they, they all live in like this desert community. Oh, and um, and then there's this woman who's part of the uh, interracial couple and she is black and she's she like goes out into the desert 
and her loses her son out there and then she comes back and tells people that you know that that all this stuff and and they're like you're crazy you know she needs help and like lo- loses him like he's just gone yeah like he's gone and okay. so they're like you're crazy you need help blah 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 nobody believes her and then our main character uh Florence Pugh starts having like these weird visions and she starts oh. having these weird dreams and she's like cleaning the window of her house at one point and she feels like the wall like presses in oh, on I the back like of that. her it's kind of like a horror yeah, movie that's really spooky <laughs> it's very spooky you're just like she feels like she's losing her mind and then she sees this woman on top of her house and the woman like slits her throat and then <gasps> these men in these red suits come and take her away and she's like telling everybody this happened, and they're like, "No, you're hysterical. You you're imagining this? Like lots oh. of gaslighting, lots of like, like you know, this is." And and all, all the other women are like, you know, kind of treating her like she's starting to lose her mind and sure, like pushing her on the that. outside because they don't want to like you know because it's a catching you know yeah. like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so so she starts to question things, and she ends up on this trolley that the because it's like a company town, so all the women shop in town. They don't leave the town. Yeah, like everything there's they need is everything there. they need is there, and she's taking this trolley from like the grocery store, and she's just out there. And the guy's like, "Oh, this is our last stop," you know. And she's like, "I'm just bored. Like I'm just out here for a joyride." And she sees this plane crash, and so she's like, "We need to stop, and we need to go out and check this out." And the guy's like, yeah. "I can't leave. Like this is my route. I can't leave." And so she gets off the trolley and she runs out into the desert and she finds this building, and she looks into the building and she like discover something but we don't know what she discovers oh and then all of a sudden she's back in her house we're like how does she get back into her house and then she starts having then she starts having more and more visions and then she starts like (laughs) oh i don't like that that sounds creepy yeah Yeah. she starts like you know and so i don't want to reveal what is actually happening but you know she starts having visions and her visions are of like modern world like oh. what because it's like, like her, her life, yeah it's like her and her her husband her husband in the in this ver- yeah. in this in this other world like her, in the 1950s world her and her husband uh versus like she's seeing them in like 19- or 2020 clothes and like talking to each other um oh interesting and so it was really interesting uh delve into like how far we've come in terms of women's rights and mm-hmm. gaslighting and um you know yeah, it was it was good. It, if you like thrillers, if you like like psychological horror, like yeah. I highly recommend it. Um, no, I'm just I just keep thinking of like the the short story, the yellow wallpaper. Uh-huh. Where she's like, "There's a woman in the walls trying uh-huh. to get out." Uh-huh. Like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. oh, it sounds so spooky. Now uh-huh. I have to watch it tonight when I get home. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's interesting too because you find out that some people are aware of what's going on. Some oh. of the women are aware and some of the women aren't. Like most of the women aren't aware. Interesting. But some of the women are and they've chosen this life. And you're just, just like Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds freaky. Yeah. Like very psychological. Yeah. I absolutely have to watch that now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. And it does a really good job of you're just like, wait, what's happening? Like yeah. what Also you're... I love Florence Pugh. Like she's so good and stuff like that. Too. Yeah. 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 Yeah, she thinks she has this idyllic life, and then all of a sudden she's like, wait. Is it idyllic? Is it idyllic? Like, what's actually happening? Where does my husband go every day? What does this company no. do? What's up with this guy who leads this victory? And and that's also really super creepy because it's like every day when she's cleaning, she's got the radio on, and the guy, Frank, like the head of the company, does like this radio show where he says all this stuff, and then they like go into 1950s music, and then like... Weird. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's, oh, so much brainwashing energy. I, oh, uh-huh, uh-huh. it's unnerving. There's a lot going on in that one. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so yeah, that's what I watched. Um, yeah, I enjoyed all of them. It was fun to watch some um, some stuff that's been on my list for a while that mm-hmm. I just, you know, hadn't got around to for one reason or another. It's fun to have like a, I don't know, like a little date night kind of thing. Yeah. It's like, no, tonight I'm going to make dinner. I'm going to watch a movie. I'm mm-hmm. going to have a good time. Like, it was really fun. Yeah. And yeah, I watched some. Watch some weird stuff, watch some funny stuff, watch some, you know, mm-hmm. of course I love a good Regency period drama, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any others that you want to add? Or you... I can mention one other one I watched. I don't really want to go into detail sure. about it because it's a, it's a weird one, but yeah. you mentioned watching, you know, how a musical when you get the big chorus numbers, it yeah. sometimes takes you out of yeah. it. Well, I had a worm in my brain that I really needed to watch Repo, the genetic opera. Okay. Um, <laughs> Never heard of it. Your okay. Face, Lisa, your face. <laughs> Um, it came out like 2009. 
Um, I watched it back in the day. It's very steampunk, very goth. It, it is an opera. Okay. It's, um, there's like one DVD copy in the system, so I'm mm-hmm. I'm not recommending it. I want to be clear. <laughs> this is not a recommendation. But it's a, it's got like a really interesting cat. Like Paris Hilton's in it. Um, okay. Anthony Stewart Head from Buffy uh-huh. is in it. He plays the dad. Okay. Um, and it's a like a dystopian kind of future uh-huh. steampunk style where um there's mass organ failure and a company kind of emerges called Gene Co. Mm-hmm. and they um like sell you organs okay. basically on finance. Okay. And then if you can't pay, they repossess your organs. Oh, okay. And it's it's an opera. Like it's it's all sung. Uh-huh. This is all musical numbers. <laughs> it's very like goth energy it's like if if evanescence did the soundtrack for an opera this is what uh-huh. it would be okay um again this is not a recommendation <laughs> it's very weird but the song is gonna the songs get stuck in your head like the soundtrack it just it hits it slaps it's so good um and there's a song where they sing about zydrate which is like the little um chemical that they use to like put off the organ failure okay. kind of thing mm-hmm. before they um replace your organs with like they have like literal barcodes on them and everything mm-hmm. Uh, and they sing a song about it, and it's just so catchy. Um, and it's like a, the grave robber that sings it, because they go, um, after you die, they go extract the zydrate from your body and then sell it on the black market to, uh-huh. like, sell the other. It's There's a lot going on, uh-huh. um, and it's just, I don't even know how to explain it. Besides, if you want to watch something really weird, yeah. and you've got a free hour and a half of your life that you don't mind never getting back, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's exactly one DVD copy in the system. It's really hard to find. It's obscure. It's weird. It's an opera. Um, the costumes are really, it's very goth. You know, mm-hmm. it's very moody. That kind of, like mm-hmm. A whole bunch of it takes place in like a graveyard. It's got that kind of like kind of um, weird technological future stuff, like where eyes can project things. But okay. hmm. yeah, I watched it. It. I'm going to leave it there. I watched it. Okay. Um, All right. All if right. you watch Fair. it, want to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Please come let me know. But this is... I'm not encouraging you to seek it out, but if you get a little (laughs) worm in your brain that you want to watch like a weird early 2000s goth opera and you really want to hear Anthony Stewart Head sing his heart out about (laughs) repossessing organs, this is it. This is for you. (laughs) All right. I might have to, I might have to check it out. Everyone's going to watch it now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as always, if you have any questions for your hosts or any comments, you can email us at shortwordstacks at gmail.com. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, or Podbean. And uh, thanks for listening and be well. The Short Stacks is produced by Lisa Quintero and Lizzie Jelly for the Short Public Library. Music for the show is by Kevin McLeod. The song is called Ice Flow and can be found on incompetech.com.